Hello, I'm Richard Nelson. I'm the author and uh, stage director of The Gabriels, which you can watch on Channel 13 or stream on Broadway HD. And I'll be talking with Rabbi Sal Solomon on Days Gone By on UNC Radio. Oh, shalom, my friends. This is your old pal and buddy, Rabbi Saul Solomon, founder and spiritual leader of Temple Sons of Bitches in Great Neck, New York. And you know, if you've listened to this Dave's Gone By radio program of the air, that I love the theater and I love talking to composers and lyricists and especially playwrights. Well, we have one with us right now, a veteran and prolific playwright whose works include Some Americans Abroad, that hopey, changey thing, the current Illyria at the Public Theater, and a trilogy called The Gabriels. More on that anon. He has had a dozen plays by the Royal Shakespeare Company, and the actors who have appeared in Richard Nelson's plays include Nathan Lane, Kate Burton, Patti LuPone, Allison Janney, Kelly O'Hara, and Frank Langella, and many, many more. He is the former chair of the playwriting department at Yale Drama School, for gosh sakes. So won't you please give me the honor of welcoming to the neighborhood Richard Nelson. Shalom! Shalom. That's quite an introduction. Thank you, Rabbi. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And I guess the first and most important question is, uh, well, well, you're certainly not Jewish, so what are you? Well, I don't know. I don't know about that. Oh! I, I, I think there's a little, there's, there's some, there's some Jewish uh, relatives uh, back in, in my history, I think. So, but uh, otherwise, I think I'm a, I'm a mixture of um, Protestant and various other kinds of Protestants. See, I didn't think there would be, because of the plays you write and the way you write, I always thought there was Puritan stock. Because you do the English people and you do history in America. It didn't occur to me that there'd be some uh, Jewish blood in you. Yeah, I think, I think, I, I think so. It's, it's not really proven, but it's, uh, I've, I've had suspicions of this. My grandparents on my mother's side came from Bergenland, Austria, and which is uh, just on the border of uh, Hungary. There's a, a real history of that area, the Jewish pogroms in the 19th century, where a lot of Jewish people became Christian because they had to. So I, I'm, I'm guessing there's some history there. I'm not sure. But uh, now it explains why you're in the theater. Now I understand, because you basically have to be Jewish or, or gay, and uh, you're neither. As far as we know. In fact, you've, you've, just on the personal side, Mazel Tov, unless I'm mistaken, you have been married for 45 years? That's right, I have. Happily. So, what is the secret? I don't know. You know, the, the secret, I think, is it is it the, how we got married. We got married when we were 21 years old. And that was way back in the early 70s, when, you know, no one got married. and you know, That was a bad thing to do, because we were too cool for that. And so uh, we weren't going to get married, but I received a fellowship uh, to go uh, outside of the country, to go to Europe for a year. And if I were married, I got $2,000 more. <laughs> oh, my so, God. So we got married. So we got married for $2,000, and it stuck. See, you are Jewish. Definitely. Has to be. <laughs> there's, there's the real, oh, my goodness. Um, so, so... Moving on, or again, to the early years, or the even earlier years. Let's see if Wikipedia has this correct, that before you saw your first play, you saw almost two dozen musicals in your life. That's right. So what were the musicals you saw that had an impact on you, some of the actors, performers? What did you see? Well, you know, basically the reason why I went to all these musicals was my mother had been a chorus girl in the theater. And she gave that up when she married my father. So, so she loved musicals, and so she she took me to these musicals. And uh, so I went with her, and I and I loved them. They had a whole range of things that could be. Uh, I remember seeing uh, Funny Girl, for example. The I, I we had bought tickets before it opened, so we had we saw Funny Girl a week after it opened. And you're talking about in New York. You're talking Broadway, yes. Sure. So you saw uh, Funny Girl with, with Barbara Streisand, I imagine? Barbara Streisand, but she had a huge range of things, from, from things, something called Mr. President that Irving Berlin wrote. Yeah. Um, uh, 
you go on, often not the, not the uh, floor of the red menace with Liza Minnelli. That was Candor and Ebb, wasn't it? Candor and Ebb, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And so a whole bunch of things like that. And uh, uh, not always, you know, uh, Here's Love, Meredith Wilson, uh, his follow-up after Music Man, which is a, about Santa Claus. Uh, I'm just, these are just coming to my head right now, that things that I've long, I've long forgotten. But did any one of them that you saw make you go, Oh, I want to do this? No, I think I loved, I think it wasn't the show so much as I just loved being in the theater. And I loved the whole presentation, the whole thing of it. That somehow that got under my skin and got me really interested in the theater. And so by the time I was 12, I was finding myself in the library, you know, saying, oh, what's this play, Death of a Salesman? Maybe I'll read that at 12. Uh-huh. So I, I, I got interested in, in, in that. And I, by the time I was 15, I was writing my own plays. Oh, man. So, so, and, and never stopped. Do you remember the first play, even as a teenager there, that you wrote and what it was about? You know, I really don't remember too much. As some, Santa Claus appeared in it in some way. I just <laughs> remember that. And I, and I wrote it. It was never performed, but I did in high school have a reading of it. So that was the first time. But I really don't quite remember. In college, on the other hand, I did a number of plays, uh, like 13, 14 plays in college. Wait, wait, you wrote 13 or 14 plays in college? Yeah, that, that I then, that I then, uh, then produced as well. I mean, now, some of the plays were only like 20 minutes long, some of them were an hour and 10 minutes long, you know, a range like that. So it's not like 14 full-length plays. No, but even so, that's uh, considering the load that a college student would have to, to sit down and write 20 plays, you know, most of which would have been probably extracurricular. As opposed yeah. to for a course, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, there was no. I had there was no theater department when I went to college, uh, so this was all extracurricular. But the so the faculty were wonderful. They just left me alone and 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 allowed me spaces to you know to do what I wanted, and that was a great great way of learning. So how did you make the jump? Okay, you're a senior in college. You've you've written these plays. They were done in that college situation in that college setting. How did you go from that to making your way as a professional dramatist? Well, it took, it took a while. When when I went to Europe with my new wife for, for the with the extra two thousand dollars, we we then came back um, and we lived outside Philadelphia and there for about a year and a half. On the radio, I was I, there was the public radio station W U H Y I think or something like that uh, in Philadelphia. They I went to them and they gave me uh, an hour slot once a month to do a radio drum. Oh my God! And they didn't pay me yeah, or anything, not. but we did. So we did radio drama for a year and a half once a month. So that was another like ten or so plays that I wrote, um, which was exciting. But still, it was all. You know, uh, amateur. I mean, we were paid, and then I I was submitting my plays to theaters, um, and I happened to send one to the Los Angeles to the theater, the Mark Taper Forum. Oh, yeah. And and they and they got in the slush pile, and someone in the literary office picked it up and liked it and showed it around, and they wrote me and they said they wanted to do it. So that was in 1975. And, uh, was that the Jablonski uh, uh, play or what? It, it, yeah, exactly, yeah, the killing of Jablonski. And that came out of uh, a couple of things. Came out of I was doing some sort of reporting at that time for a paper called The Drummer in Philadelphia, which is like the you know, the alternative, the Village Voice of that time in Philadelphia. And I was covering this trial about the killing, the killing of uh, Jack Jablonski. So I wrote this play, which was a, not at all. A, a realistic play, quite of a, a fant- fantasy in a way, about the idea of about the notion of reporting and, and news, and um, it got picked, it picked up in L.A. and then it was done in New York and the L.A. tapered to the next play of mine, and, and I never stopped. I just that was a very good lucky break. And when you first, when you sent uh, the Yablonsky play to California, did you have an agent at that point, or were you still just across the transom? I had no agent. In fact. Uh, you know, this is well, well before the internet, and the only way I could there wasn't even a there wasn't even a, even a guide where you could send plays. There was no no listing of of theaters anywhere. So I I heard about theaters, and I would make lists, and 
I would go to the main branch of the public library in Philadelphia, where there, across the wall, was, a, was all of these telephone books, you know, from all over the country. Yeah. I went and I picked up the Los Angeles telephone book and found the address for the Mark Paper form, and that's how I said it. Oh, my God. I mean, this is even before the drama the source book, for God's sakes. Correct. I'm... Yeah, absolutely. Before the drama the source book. Oh, my God. That was a big thing when that came out. That was a whole... That was a big thing. I remember when that first came out. Now, I want to also ask, all those plays you did in college, all those plays you did for the radio, and then even into the 1970s, do you ever look those over, or have you put them in a box, and you're like, I was a kid, I was in my 20s, I, da, 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 da. I don't even look at anything I've written before 1990. Or are you able to go back and say, ooh, that had talent, that was juvenilia, that was somewhere in the middle? Uh, they're all in a box. <laughs> I, I have a tendency just to keep looking forward. I, I don't even look back at plays that I wrote in the 90s or even the plays that I wrote five years ago. I just keep looking forward. Um, so I, I don't look back at something unless there's a need to. If someone wants to revive it and ask me questions, uh, then I then I, I go back and take a look. But I'm, I'm, I'm a very, you know, proactive guy, and I just keep I enjoy what's coming next as opposed to what's happened. Now you have done, by the way, we're talking with Richard Nelson, and I should mention, I, I haven't even said yet, that if you want to see a big sample of Richard Nelson's recent work, if you are in New York, you can watch public television, PBS TV, Channel 13, will be showing all three parts of his trilogy, The Gabriels, Election Year in the Life of One Family. It was filmed back in March at the Public Theater. And uh, first of all, tell us about The Gabriels. Well, The, the Gabriels, a, this is a, um, a, a very interesting uh, uh, experiment in many ways um, that the Public Theater, where I've done some a lot of my work recently, and where I have a very close connection to the extraordinary artistic director, Oscar Eustace, who I've known for well over 30 years. And Oscar uh, did something with, with me that is very, very rare in the theater. He, I went to him with an idea of doing three plays, tracking a family in real time during the election year 2016. And I needed, in order to go forward with it, I needed his commitment not only to commission the plays, but to agree to productions. That is, before word was written, which he did, and the public did. And so I started in 2015 sketching out these plays, and then from January of 2016, they, uh, the, the, the public basically gave me one of their five theaters, uh, the Wester Hall. And there... Uh, so starting with the first Hungary, which was set in March uh, 2016, we follow a family um, in three different evenings, one in March, one in September, and then one on election night itself in 2016. And each, pl it's, it's, it's just conversations around the table where we, the audience, overhear them and learn about them and learn about their lives and their problems and the various things they do, the resiliences and so forth and so on. All the while, they make a meal. Each each play is, is, is a meal being prepared. And once the meal is finished, being prepared, they go off and eat it, and that's the end of that play. And so each of these plays was written up to the day that it was set, meaning I've added lines, made changes, uh, as late as 4.30 in the afternoon for a play that would then open at 7.30 that night. So that was a very extraordinary event, and you can imagine what it was like on election night, um, 2016. So, so wait a minute. So, so the third act—I'm not calling it the third act—the third play in the in the trilogy. So you were writing that up until the moment of November, whatever it was, sixth or seventh. November eighth, to eighth. Five, up to up to four thirty that afternoon on November eighth. I was adding line. Yes. And then the play physically. Open on election night? Or no, you oh, couldn't have. Couldn't, it, yeah, no. it physically opened a few hours later on election night, beginning at 7.30, so before the polls closed. And so the... How could the actors they, remember their lines? Well, I just added a few, but they were game, and they're an amazing group of actors, and they, and and it's exciting. It's exciting. It's you know, just, just enough to make it 
clear that it's happening that day. So they had little references that audiences might have heard about that happened that day. So uh, which could be the weather, it could be an event, it could be whatever. Could you hear in the audience in those moments when you put in something that literally was on uh, Facebook or the news that morning and suddenly they, they hear an actor saying that on stage? Did they go like, oh my, whoa, did, did you yes, feel that? Exactly. There's like a gas. free soul. There were times when there would be gas. When it, 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 they couldn't believe it, that, that they were watching something that was happening on that day, that where they sat, and when they sat there, and and so, uh, but the characters of the play, just like the audience that night, they don't know what's going to happen in that election. So the play ends before the polls are closed. Whoa! That's how it ends. And you weren't tempted to to add a fourth play that happened, say, three months into the Trump administration. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I, people have asked me that, but I think you'll see, you'll see that it's a, just a wonderful, I, I, I think it's just a wonderful uh, uh, a series of snapshots of a very significant time in our country. And I think that, that as opposed to, and people over here, and you, right now, when you watch them on TV right now, I think you, 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 you watch, one will watch them with, their, with that, you know, incredible hindsight that the characters don't have. And you'll find things that are very interesting because of that. I do have to uh, apologize to our listeners here in Colorado and, and across the rest of the country. In New York, you can watch this trilogy. I think it's starting on December 3rd. Then there's another on the 5th and the 7th. Is that how you're doing it? Yes, yes, it is. But, but also, also the, the co-producer of the television is Broadway HD. And beginning this month, uh, people will be able to go on to Broadway HD anywhere in the world and stream these plays. I, I mean, there's a fee for that, I assume. But yeah, there's a fee. There's a fee, right? There's a fee, but, but not if, a big one. If you're in New York, uh, it's free on Channel 13. But elsewhere, you can watch this as well as all the other stuff that they do on Broadway HD. So it's it's like a cable channel for theater, which is fantastic. I think. So I do too. And this, the interesting thing is. This is not your first trilogy. You did uh, a well-received trilogy before that called The Apple Family Plays, also set in Rhinebeck, New York. And do you have another trilogy coming on, or...? Uh, I ha I'm working on... I'm just beginning on working on something that... Not so much a trilogy, but a, maybe a... a, a, a but, but, but something that's also quite long. And because what we were able to do with The Apple Family Plays is we put them all together, and they ran about eight hours. Whoa. All together, so you, so we had marathons where people would go and watch it all together, and we did the same with the Gabriels, which runs about six and a half to seven hours. And for both of these groups of plays, we toured them around the world. And so we were we took the Gabriels last year to Australia and Hong Kong, where where we had Mandarin supertitles, where people sat and reading for seven hours watching these plays. We, we took them to Berlin, to Hamburg, to Amsterdam, to Brighton, England. And this was the public theater production that was, was touring? That's correct. Wow. Wow. Yeah, we, and it was, it was an extraordinary event. Everywhere we went, people were surprised. And in, in part, people were, I got a number of comments of people who just came to thank me because they said, given the... Given the world today, it was so important for them to see American Americans portrayed who were thoughtful and complicated and questioning, um, and just just it made made them feel um, connected again, a human being to human being. And what's interesting, uh, you you had said this in another interview that. One of the plays opens. The first line is, uh, you should pardon the expression, it has the, the F word in it, but it's, it's about, what was it, Chris Cuomo? The, the it, it, guy? No, not Chris Cuomo, it, it, Andrew Cuomo. Andrew, I'm sorry, Andrew Cuomo. And it says, fuck Andrew Cuomo. You should pardon the expression. But, uh, and, and you, and I'm sure the public theater was wondering, well, if we bring that to Japan, if we bring that to some other, they're going to, who the hell is that? But it didn't matter, it got a laugh anyway. It, it, it didn't matter. It both got a laugh, and also they they, they they substituted their own politician for Andrew Cuomo and made a laugh even more. Oh! It, it was very interesting how these plays traveled. I had initially thought they were too specific. 
perfect to travel this way, but it was people from a, a major theater in Germany, in Berlin, called the Schaubühne, who came to see these plays in New York, and they convinced me, spent two hours convincing me how, why these plays needed to come to Berlin. And it's on the basis of that that we built these tours, and I have been amazed and so proud uh, of the reaction we received. Now, you've been working most of your career, either in England or off-Broadway. I didn't realize it was all the touring as well. Um, but you're not doing as much in the UK as you were about a decade or two back when you, with a lot of stuff at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Is there a reason, or is it just a little hiatus, or what? I, I think it's a little hiatus. I think, I, think, I think what happened is about 15 years ago, I, ago when that shift started to happen, back to New York is when I started to direct my own work a great deal. And it's much easier to direct your work because in your own country because you have connections with actors and you have connections with designers and, and, and it requires a lot more time at, at, on, you know, on the ground than when you've just been the writer where you can come and go. So I think that's been part of it. But I think that's sort of changing. I've got a number of projects right now in, in the UK. Um, so I'm 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 hoping to get that uh, uh, get that uh, uh, that world uh, uh, going again as well. Well, actually, uh, when you were head of Yale Drama School, didn't you tell your kids, "Oh, never direct your own work. Now you you uh, yes, you're too close did. to it. You can't see the forest so for the trees." I, I, yeah. My my whole experience as a as a as a playwright, my early experience, the first twenty years in a professional theater, I I thought that playwrights should not direct their own work. Because I've seen so many times when the playwrights had and how bad it was. It was they, 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 the playwrights were so focused on getting their words spoken in a certain way and controlling the event that they were it was it was boring or it was cold or it was distant. And so I I, I that I that's what I believed. I wrote a book with their director and t wrote that in the book. Um, but then a series of things happened to me uh, where I had to take over a, a couple of productions because of problems, and I found out, one, that I enjoyed it, and that, two, um, I, I, uh, I, I learned something about myself as a playwright, which just really shocked me, is that when I write my plays, I don't hear them, and I don't see them. Actually, what I do is I feel them. So there's a, like a dynamic that I have in the writing. So what that means is I can go into a rehearsal room and I need to first convince the actors that I don't see, and I, I don't know how they should sound, I don't know how these plays, this play should look, that we will explore it together as a team and a collaboration. But because I can feel the play, trust me, actors, that I know when something's wrong. So if we try something and I say, no, that's not right, let's just try then something else. And so I found that working with really supportive and smart and talented actors, and once they get behind this and, and realize that I mean what I'm saying, that I don't know, it's a lot of, it's a great joy, it's a great collaboration, and you end up with really deep and profound work, I think, with everybody working at, to the best of their abilities uh, for, the, for the same goal. Well, actually, I, I will put in a plug for the cast of The Gabriels because one of the actors in there is a recent friend of the neighborhood. He was just on this program about a month ago, J.O. Sanders, who is a very fine actor. And he's a, he, is he in Illyria, too? or No, he's not in Illyria. In Illyria, it's all young people, and the Gabriels are all you know actors or characters are in their 50s or 60s or 70s. Uh, so he's not, uh, but he is, uh, uh, Jay is, is, has been in the, the earlier, the Apple Family plays. Um, I've known Jay uh, when he, he acted in a play of mine in 1978, I think. Wow. We've known each other that long and been good, close friends. He's about to, he's about to um, play uh, Uncle Vanya in a production of Vanya that I'm directing at the Old Globe in San Diego. Oh, my muzzle. Oh my! Yeah, so we're going to do that. In, that opens in February. So uh, you, have you directed? I'm sure uh, with all the stuff you've done, you've directed Chekhov before, because that's that's kind of uh, tough. No, 
No, I never have. I, I directed a, a, a Turgenev, which is sort of a little like a month in the country, which is a, a play that Chekhov admired a great deal and learned from. But no, I haven't. This is going to be my first time, and I'm very, very excited about it. Now, I'm sorry to, to gloss over Illyria, which is currently at the public theater. Is it until, uh, until when? Do you remember? Yes, until the 10th of December. So another, uh, what, another, well, another week. Basically. Yeah, oh, good. I think it got extended a week because it was supposed to be like December 3rd, and, they, and it was so popular that they added more performances. But Illyria is very special to yes. the public theater because it's the story of the public theater. It's, it's the story of the beginnings, and indeed it is, yes. Joseph Papp, who created the public theater, is the main character of, of, of Valeria, but he's a very young man, and uh, it's, it's not the Joseph Papp uh, big uh, heroic figure visionary that is, we often uh, uh, see or hear described. It's a, a young man, confused, trying to survive. Now, let me ask you, uh, Richard Nelson, I assume you were commissioned by the public to write that piece, especially since it's going on the 50th anniversary of the public theater. So how much time did you have to put in for sheer research and background before you could sit down and actually just write a play? Uh, it's, it's months. It's with, certainly months. Um, I had uh, what was very, what was the most fun was I had access to Joe's um, papers in archives, which sit at the Lincoln Center Library, but they're closed. But because it's, the public was behind me, they gave, you know they gave me the key, the access to it. So that was I spent a lot of time going through those. That was really interesting, and um, and and uh, you know, and I read a lot. But it, but it took took some months, without doubt. Well, people can still see Illyria at the public for one more week. And, of course, you can watch The Gabriels either on Broadway HD or coming up this, starting this weekend on PBS TV Channel 13 in New York. Do you have time for a couple more questions with us, uh, Richard Nelson? Sure, absolutely. Oh, fantastic. Well, I, I want to, first of all, get back to musicals for a moment or two. You have an interesting take that you told uh, to Bomb Magazine, which I uh, never heard of, me being so afraid of terrorists, but but you told them that your take on miking in Broadway theaters might anger purists a little bit. Well, I think I think what I'm what I'm interested in is a kind of um, I'm trying I want to create a kind of uh, uh, acoustic sound. So I want it to sound acoustic, so it's not really loud mic, but so but at the same time. That requires that, 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 that compared to a lot of other miking, it may come across as a, as a little bit uh, uh, soft. Uh, so it forces uh, an audience to lean forward and listen and participate and actively listen and actively participate. And that's a little different than what a lot of Broadway shows, certainly what a, broad, a lot of Broadway musicals do, which is sort of blast at you. Right. I hate that. I have to admit, it's just you know you sit there for two and a half hours and it's just all coming at you in these waves, and you just want to breathe, you know. Exactly. You want to breathe. You want to be. You want to be treated as a human being, as simply just as an object, as a receptacle of stuff. So that's what I've tried to do. And then when I've done when I've when I've done a, a couple of musicals that I directed, that I've tried to make them as human as possible in that way. Yeah. It's just kind of funny because, as you even mentioned in that article, the famous line of, of people saying, oh, God, oh, for the days when Ethel Merman was in a show and she could sing and, and her voice would ping against the back of the thing and everybody heard her. But the, the, under, the other part of that is she's surrounded by 30 other actors where sometimes you have to sit there and go, what, 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 what did they say? Well, who's that? What did they say? <laughs> so, that can be true too. But also speaking of uh, of musicals, for people who are chess enthusiasts, and I don't mean Shelby Lyman, uh, do you think that will ever get another big shot? Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know. The, the, you know, there's a um, the, there's a lot of efforts to do that. It had a really good production uh, revival at a theater called The Signature in Washington D.C., which I saw, which I really liked. Um, they, you know, they, they, they keep, um, meaning, meaning, uh, I think Tim Rice and, 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 and the, the other guys, uh, Benny and Bjorn, I think they keep thinking that, um, uh, that, that maybe a, a, a different approach to the material would, would, would work better than what we did on Broadway. And, and, uh, and they'll, they'll try and figure that out. Uh, the history of chess was really, 
quite complicated. Um, they, you know, they they wrote it them, themselves, and Benny and Bjorn and and and, T- and Tim, and they did it as a through song musical. And uh, Michael Bennett was uh, uh, going to direct it, and Michael Bennett had cast it and designed it, and it was going to be a big dance through song musical. It was all set to go, and then Michael Bennett quit. And he quit. He didn't say why, but we later learned he quit because he found found out that he had AIDS and he was dying. And so this musical was sort of suspended, and the producers went to Trevor Nunn, who was a big a big success in Les Mis and Cats and other things. And um, and Trevor said uh, he would come in and do his best, given you know the design and given the the through song musical. But if he if it ever went to Broadway, he wanted to turn it into a book musical. And so that's how I got involved. Once it, 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 they decided to bring it to, to Broadway, Trevor, who I knew through the Royal Shakespeare Company, asked me if I would write, the, write a new book for it. So you were already that's trying not, to sort of shoehorn a libretto into something that was already almost of a piece, which is rather difficult. It was a very complicated, very, very complicated um, uh, uh, job. Uh, but one that I enjoyed very much. I really enjoyed it. I worked a lot, obviously, very, very closely with Trevor and with Benny and Bjorn. I didn't see a lot of Tim because he was a, away most of the time, but uh, I spent a lot of time with Benny and Bjorn, who I adore. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I feel like I, I came in, you know, late on the on the projects, and so I'll see what, the, you know, where the, they, I just hear rumors that there are different times, different things are going to happen with it. So, you know, I hope it does. Now, another musical that actually the uh, producer and host of this radio program, Dave, saw on Broadway and enjoyed very, very much and was surprised to, as I'm sure a lot of people were. How many people told you that you were out of your mind when you decided to to work on a musical version of James Joyce's The Dead? Well, I would say everyone. Pretty much everyone for a long time. I I, I couldn't get through the door of anywhere, you know? Uh... It, it just really was was difficult. And then once people saw it, they said, "Oh, well, this is an obvious show because it's about a musical evening in a in a in someone's uh, in a house." So it, it was it was tricky, but it was um, it was a great great joy. Uh, I'm very very proud of that show. Yeah, it was. Uh, Dave says it was just a lovely piece, and, and everybody, most people who saw it, really quite enjoyed it. They, and going in, they were thinking, "What on earth? How you know? Who does a, a musical about this?" But there you go. <laughs> we're talking with Richard Nelson. I got a couple of cute questions for you. Sure. Got to ask these cute, cute questions. You don't have that huge a filmography or, or televisionography, at least according to IMDb, but you did do a movie, or write a movie, called Hyde Park on the Hudson with Bill Murray playing uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Do you have any Bill Murray stories? Well, I do. I have a million Bill Murray stories. Oh. I spent a great deal of time with Bill. Uh, you know, he's one of the... He's, he's not only a brilliant rock actor, but he's a Really generous, generous human being. Um, the first time, the first time I met uh, Bill, I mean, he had been cast in the in the role. He agreed to play the role. That's probably a better way to put it. And uh, I live about uh, fifteen minutes from Hyde Park, which is you know, Roosevelt's home and and the Presidential Library. And I, and one Sunday around eleven o'clock in the morning, I get a phone call, and it's Bill. He says, "Hi, I'm I'm at the Roosevelt home." I said, I said, you want me to join you? He said, yeah, I want you to come on down. So I had him. I just get in the car and I go down there, and he's in the little tiny restaurant, which is, which is you know, can't be more than five tables. And by the time I get there, he knows everybody's name. He knows the guy, the cook. He knows the waitress. He knows the people who are eating. As we wind around, we see that there's a guard walking by. He calls the guard by name. He's been there like, you know, 30 minutes, and he, 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 he knows everybody. And he's made everyone feel warm and very uh, comfortable. And then we had a special tour, because clearly, you know, Bill was there, so it was a special tour. And to go through the the house and, and uh, the museum, but especially the house, and then, and then Val Kill, Eleanor Roosevelt's home, with, uh, with Bill was, you know, He'd check out the clothes. He, he was quite extra, extraordinary. Oh, that's, that's-
it's so lovely to, you know, everybody thinks that uh, when interviewers interview these people, they, they want the dirt, they want the, the bad stories, the nasty stories, but, but we want the fun, lovable stories about the actors that, and the performers that we love. And it's so great to hear that he really is as he seems to all of us. He is. He, he really is. He's a, he's a really generous, really, really, I mean, and he, he talks to people. He, he talks to people in just such a, a, you know, a direct way that people are, are just, they feel like they know him and he, there's no, there's no wall there. It's a, he's an it's, it's extraordinary guy. It really is. And I have to ask also about one of my favorite, if not my favorite Broadway actor, Nathan Lane who was in a, a play of yours as well. Any stories about him? Um, Nathan came in and did uh, Some Americans Abroad. He actually replaced someone in it. Oh. Moved to Broadway. Uh, and this was quite a long time ago before Nathan was well known. Uh, and I've, I've seen and Nathan a million times since then. And he's, he too is a, is a, is a really fine man with a, with a you know, great, great reputation in terms of just being very supportive and um, uh, uh, he's, he's always he's been very generous to me and, and gave one heck of a performance in my play, really. I, I, you know, he's known for being, you know, uh, comedic. And what, he, he can be, he, he's a very serious actor with real serious depth. Well, let me ask one also a uh, question here of uh, Richard Nelson in terms of are you... I'm sure you're supportive of, but are you friends with other playwrights in your certain? And are you all supportive, or is there a little bit of um, competition there, or a little bit of both? Yeah, you know, it's it's it's. It, I think it's hard to be too close. There's a uh, there's a few playwrights that I, I've been close to over over the years, um, but but mostly I think we, we you know, which is I think understandable because it's such a small pond. Mm. I think we more, we circle around each other, you know. I, I remember being, well, I lived in you know, Rhinebeck, New York, which is 100 miles north of the city. And I remember when I was living in New York at one time, I went to, um, I went to a, uh, a, a, into the grocery store, and, I, I, and then I ran into two playwrights I know. And they, and they said, how are you doing? How's your play coming? And it was like the last thing I wanted to talk about in the <laughs> store was, was how my play was coming. I was trying to forget that. And so being in Rhinebeck has been, um, been, been a, a good, um, given me a good distance from that world. Well, we are very lucky and happy to have Richard Nelson in our world, both here in the neighborhood and, of course, first of all, at the Public Theater, you can watch his play Illyria running through next weekend, and it's all about the history of Joe Papp and the Public Theater. And if you are in New York, starting this weekend, you can watch the Gabriels' election year in the life of one family. It's on Channel 13. They're doing three separate parts of the trilogy, uh, one day each apart. You just have to look in the listings. If you're not in New York, you can sign up for Broadway HD and watch it there. Last question for you, uh, Richard Nelson. Now that you're in this position of being such a prolific and so produced as a playwright, do you ever still pick up an idea, write 10 pages, 15, 20 pages, and then <clears throat> it never goes anywhere, it gets in the drawer, or is everything commissioned, and if you start it, it, it eventually finishes? No, so I've got things that I've, not just 10 pages, I've got hundreds of pages of things that are not done, that that's it, and that, that I invested uh, half a year in, but I decided, you know, it just does, didn't work, it just couldn't work, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's a crapshoot. You just push yourself. You keep going. You keep going and keep trying. And each time, it's you start from that blank page, and who knows where you're going. Well, actually, that I'm going to make that the penultimate question. So this is the other ultimate question. Then, <laughs> what is your your process? Do you map out a certain couple of hours every single day for writing, or do you do it when it strikes you, or what? I'm I'm very uh, I'm very organized and I'm very structured and I'm very habitual. I I have a beautiful office, uh, uh, which is a little house behind my house. I'm here I'm there right now, and it's it's um, uh, I, I I I'm here every day. I, I I get to my office every day over the weekends, maybe only in the morning, but during the week I'm here. I I'm an early riser, so I'm here by eightish, and I'm. You know, I work 
through to lunch, and then I'll try and do more business and other stuff in the afternoon and quit around 5 or 6. So it's really a full, a regular work day. It's just those first few hours is, is pure creativity. That's fantastic. Absolutely. Well, it's been fantastic having Richard Nelson. All I ask is that uh, you, you do a next trilogy of a family called like, uh, Shmulevitz. You should do this. <laughs> and, and base one of the characters on me. That's all I ask. I don't ask much. <laughs> But I also ask everyone to watch Richard Nelson's work and to thank us for having Richard Nelson in the neighborhood. Much more success, much more writing and creativity, and shalom to you. And to you. Thank you, Rabbi.